So let's begin our second talk in which we reflect on the theme of the kingdom of God in Mark chapters 9 through 12. To reflect on this theme, I'm going to examine the image that Jesus gives of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. So this is chapter 8, verses 14 through 21. So Jesus tells them when they're running out of bread in the boat, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they get frustrated. They don't really understand what he's saying. And Jesus, in turn, gets frustrated with them and say, says, are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? So let's think about what this means. Mark recounts two miracles of the multiplication of the loaves. The feeding of the 5,000 happens along the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. So that's a Jewish area. And the fact that they collected 12 baskets of leftovers uh, is, is symbolic of this. 12 symbolizes Israel, the 12 tribes, 12 baskets of leftovers being collected is a mark of the fact that this was a feeding of the Jews. Now, the feeding of the 4,000 happens in the Decapolis. So this is going to be on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. The crowd was with them for three days, had nothing to eat, and he then uh, performs the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. And at that, they collect seven baskets. So what's the significance of the seven? seven? The number seven signifies the nations of the world. So when Jesus highlights this, he points out that they have first dined with the Jews, then his Jewish disciples contributed to multiplying the loaves for the Gentiles, and by implication, they dined with them. They have all now dined together as a greater family. Now, in the Jewish law, there were significant restrictions on diet. And to us, this may seem strange, but in the context of the time, it actually made a lot of sense. Relationships form and are strengthened by dining together. Conversely, relationships can be disrupted or interrupted by not dining together or by making it impossible to dine together. And so the Jewish dietary restrictions had the effect of keeping the Jewish people from dining with Gentiles, keeping them socially separate. And at the time God gave them the dietary restrictions through the Mosaic law, it's what they needed. And the reason they needed it is God wanted to keep them as a people that were a coherent witness and testimony to the one true God. And to that end, they needed to avoid socializing with those who would distract them from that mission. Throughout the Old Testament, we can see how the Jewish people socializing with the Gentile nations around them often led them away from God. You know, Solomon with his foreign wives is perhaps the most egregious example of this, but there are many others really throughout the Old Testament. So the Pharisees and Herod, those looking for a military Messiah to establish an earthly kingdom of God, consider it very important to maintain that social separation 
so that when the Messiah comes under that Messiah's leadership, they can overthrow the Romans and reestablish David's kingdom as uh, an expression of their nationalism, so to speak. So that's the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Herod, although ultimately he serves the Romans, styles himself as the king of the Jews and daydreams, no doubt, of being an independent king one day. Now, this isn't the way that Jesus is approaching these matters. A major theme we've seen throughout the Gospel of Mark up to here is that dispensing with the ceremonial aspects of the Jewish law is part of what his plan involves for the kingdom of God. He has made all foods clean. So Jesus brings an end to the dietary laws. Why? So that Jews and Gentiles can dine together as one people in the kingdom of God. And this is something that is proving difficult for the 12 to accept. They continue to be beguiled by the nationalistic idea of the kingdom of God espoused by the Pharisees. So in particular, every time Jesus predicts his death and resurrection, they respond in a way that indicates their obsession with establishing the earthly kingdom. Peter rebukes Jesus for predicting his death because a dead Jesus is not going to lead an earthly kingdom. The twelve argue amongst themselves who is the greatest because they're obsessed with their position in this earthly kingdom to come. James and John contend to be at the right and left hand of Jesus because, again, they are contending for their position in the earthly Davidic kingdom to come. In contrast, the kingdom of God as Jesus envisions it isn't a nationalistic kingdom. It involves everyone. And the way it involves everyone is in a unifying Eucharistic kingdom. Recall that the Syrophoenician woman, when she approaches Jesus, Jesus says to her, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. The children's bread is, of course, Jesus himself. And she replies, let the children first be, or no, she answered him, sorry, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. So what happens after this is that she has, in effect, interceded on behalf of not just her own daughter, but all the Gentiles. And we see that immediately after this, Jesus heads to the Decapolis, a Gentile region, performs a healing of the deaf and the mute man. And then what happens is the feeding of the 4,000. The multiplication of the loaves follows immediately from this. This is a Eucharistic miracle. This is what Jesus is bringing in the true kingdom of God. That's the true bread that he's calling on the disciples to discern. And we'll see the fulfillment of this, of course, later on when we examine chapters 13 through 16, which include the Last Supper. And we'll come back to this theme at that time. But bringing together all people who seek to follow God in the, to the Eucharistic table is at the heart of the kingdom of God. And this is one of many important ways in which the Catholic Church represents the kingdom of God that Jesus brought about in its earthly journey before its final consummation in heaven. Now, because Jesus has come to oppose this nationalistic interpretation 
of the kingdom of God. One of the ways in which that nationalistic interpretation is manifest is in the behavior of the Jewish authorities with regard to the temple. So let's consider now the cleansing of the temple. So in chapter 11, uh, verses 1 to 33, we have the cleansing of, uh, um, we have the cleansing of the temple bracketed by the cursing of the fig tree. The fig tree is a symbol for Israel in the Old Testament. Some examples of this are Jeremiah 8.13 and 29.17, the book of the prophet Joel, chapter 1, verse 7, and the book of the prophet Hosea, chapter 9, verses 10 and, and 16. So when Jesus approaches the fig tree, he finds nothing on it, for it was not the season for figs. That is the Jewish people had become sufficiently obsessed with their earthly position that they had lost their vision of the spiritual dimension of their calling as a people. They were no longer bearing fruit. The fig tree no longer bore fruit. And so when they enter Jerusalem, they enter the temple. Jesus begins to drive out those who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he taught and said to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So at this point, why is he driving out the money changers? because the Jewish people were using the temple as a means of fundraising rather than making it a house of prayer for all nations. In that way, their use of the temple reinforced the nationalistic interpretation of the kingdom of God. And in turn, then, the temple was going to have to go. So the cursing of the fig tree foreshadows the destruction of the temple, which ultimately happened in 70 AD after the Gospel of Mark was written. In my interpretation of, of things, my understanding of things. But the time of the temple as the focus of worship is coming to an end. And that's because the Jewish authorities are unprepared for the mission God is assigning them. They've made it a house of robbers, not a house of prayer for all the nations. This is reinforced in the parable of the wicked tenants at the beginning of chapter 12. This is where the man planted the vineyard, uh, set the hedge around it, and sent servants to the tenants. He was preaching this against the Jewish authorities. Again, they were obsessed with restoration of the Davidic kingdom. For that matter, so were the crowds. In chapter 11, during all the hosannas as Jesus enters Jerusalem, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Jesus has to clarify for the crowds that it's not an earthly kingdom that he's coming to bring. In chapter 12, uh, verse 35, he says, how can the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? David himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? Jesus is emphasizing here that as the son of God, he, Jesus, is Lord over David. He is coming to establish not a Davidic kingdom, but something greater. Now, the nature of this greater kingdom is hard to understand. And part of where we see it being hard to understand is when children are brought to Jesus. So this is uh, chapter 9, verses... Uh, oops. Oh, sorry. No, the blessing of the children, sorry, is in chapter 10. Um, 
verse uh, 13, right? So they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. Now, for those obsessed with the idea of the kingdom of God as a nationalistic earthly kingdom, children are not terribly useful. They're not going to be a useful part of your army driving forth your foes ahead of them. Hence, they don't see the point. But Jesus is saying in the kingdom of God, you have to receive it like a child. Very different way to think about it. For me, part of thinking about this has come from my experience as a parent. Having five kids, that experience is extensive um, at this point. And early on, when I was a new father, we, we our first child was an infant. You know, there was, at one point, I think I had had very little sleep over a period of a couple of days, and that infant just would not stop crying. And I was getting pretty angry about it and pretty upset about it, actually. I was fatigued. I was tired. I just needed her to be quiet. But in that moment, I had a sudden epiphany, realization. It just kind of all sunk in for me in that moment. That between that infant and the outer darkness, what lies between her and that was me. That was my calling. That's what God had called me to do was no matter what, at any possible cost, no matter how tired I am or whatever, I am called to be that infant's defender against anything, against the darkness, against anything that might happen. And over the years, I have often been astonished at the level of trust that my children in turn place in me. I know how flawed I am as a human being. I know how unworthy I am as a human being. But my children see me as their father and the amount of trust that they place in me is unbelievable and have placed in me you know, throughout their lives. And so, of course, I strive to be worthy of that trust. I strive to be the kind of father who's worth trusting like that, you know. And it's been a great blessing that I've, I've had the opportunity to try to rise to that calling. And so to receive the kingdom of God like a child means to have that same kind of trust in Jesus, to be ready to follow him, to trust him, to trust that ultimately he will keep away the darkness and lead us into the light. And that's not the kind of trust that the disciples were manifesting in that particular moment. Now, wealth can be deceptive in the sense that we can try to trust wealth as a way of saving ourselves from anything that might happen. And that's one reason why the rich man ran away in sadness. He so entrusted his riches that when Jesus told him it was time to let them go, he couldn't. That is how Jesus looked upon him with love. Jesus knew that he needed to let go of his wealth so that he could trust in Jesus like a little child. That's what he needed, and he wasn't ready to accept it in that moment. <clears throat> 
but it's hard to accept in general, which is why he launches into the speech about the camel and the eye of the needle. Wealth is not automatically a bad thing or an evil thing. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm a father of five children. I have the responsibility to provide for them, and that requires accumulating wealth. But it's important that the wealth be a servant and not a master, and that I be willing to part with it as needed, as the rich man was called to do. And in a way, the, the widow giving her last two pennies is an image of that as well. Out of her poverty has put in everything she had, her whole living. She has put in more than all of those who are contributing. St. Mother Teresa talked about the importance of being willing to give to the poor until it hurts in some way, until it costs you something in some way. And that can be a test as to whether or not we've become too attached to our wealth. You know, the question about Caesar and taxes alludes to this as well. They posed him the question about Caesar. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? The wealth of Caesar, of course, is the source of his power. And so if one is giving him taxes, it's giving Caesar power to the detriment of an earthly kingdom of God. But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Bring me a coin and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, it's Caesar's. Now, why did they have coins of Caesar on them? It's because they were counting on wealth as a means of achieving their goals. They were attached to wealth for that purpose. And they were so attached that they were willing to have in their pockets a coin with the graven image of Caesar on it. Now, part of the problem there is, right, Caesar proclaims himself a god. So they've got an image of a pagan god, alleged pagan god, on a coin that was in their pockets. Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. That coin, it's just wealth, monetary things. That doesn't save you. What is it that saves you? Repentance, forgiveness, that's what saves. And those are the things to render unto God. Now, Mark, Mark is, is fair here. Not all the scribes are bad, right? So like uh, chapter 12, verse 28, uh, scribe, Ask Jesus about the greatest commandment. Jesus has a discussion with him about it, in which he concludes by saying to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So not all the Jews there were caught up in all of this, and those who were willing to listen were not far from the kingdom of God, the true kingdom of God. They weren't all bad. Many of them were. But not all of them were. The key was that they needed to set aside their worldly allegiances in order to enter the kingdom of God. So all of this, here are some questions for reflection. First question would be, what worldly concerns or allegiances do I have that distract me from following what Jesus may be calling me to do? Second reflection question, in what ways might I see the kingdom of God more clearly if I were to adopt the perspective of a child?